end of each talk, the speaker will answer a few questions. Um, I am Amy Ando. I am a professor in the Department of Ag and Consumer Economics and co-director of the Center for the Economics of Sustainability. Um, we're gonna have three short talks today, uh, each spotlighting key points in the work of some people affiliated with CEOs. Um, we'd like to thank support for the, from the College of ACES and the Department of ACE. Um, and with that, I would just like to turn it over to Erica Myers. Great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so my talk today is about how we can use machine learning to increase the impact of energy efficiency programs. And this work is joint with Peter Christensen and Paul Francisco, who are at the University of Illinois, and our current and former graduate students, Hanson Chow and Mateus Souza. So the motivation for our work is that there's a longstanding conventional wisdom that there's an energy efficiency gap. So the idea is that there are lots of investments that could be made in residential housing and commercial buildings that would more than pay for themselves in terms of the energy savings that they would create. And that there's a lot of these that exist. And if that's true, then energy efficiency investments are a win-win for climate policy. So the idea is this is low hanging fruit. If we can uh, make these investments, not only are we gonna save consumers money, but we would get carbon reductions as well. So uh, just to drive this point home a little more, we can look at this graphic that was made about 10 years ago by uh, McKinsey and Company. And here they're depicting global greenhouse gas abatement, uh, greenhouse gas abatement cost curve, uh, where we've got abatement costs in euros per ton of carbon equivalent on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, these are different measures that we can do to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And they're ranked from lowest cost to highest cost. So anything below the x-axis here, the implication is that we can get these carbon reductions at negative cost. These are investments that are cost effective anyway, and once you have more efficient stuff in your house, it's going to reduce carbon emissions. And that's very exciting for policymakers who are under a lot of pressure to do something about global warming. And it seems like this win-win opportunity um, as opposed to trying to regulate industry or something like that. Now, to be clear, the way that these bars are calculated are based on engineering estimates of the difference in energy consumption between the status quo and something that's more energy efficient. All right, but this could, these are not necessarily tested on the ground. These aren't realized savings. So recent work in economics in, these, in the last 10 years or so has drawn attention to a wedge between the projected and realized savings and show that benefits don't outweigh the costs on average when the realized savings fall way short of what we project. So this research has resulted in these types of headlines. So we have one from 2017, why government energy efficiency programs sound great, but often don't work. Study finds costs of residential energy efficiency investments are double the benefits. And we just put a box around a passage here that's particularly relevant, which is that these results are suggesting that many government backed programs fail to deliver on this promise of a win win, which spells big problems for efforts to um, confront climate change. All right, so a lot of governments seeing that win win opportunity uh, in their efforts to attack climate change, a huge portion of that is supposedly coming from energy efficiency. So if we're not getting what we think we're getting, that's going to be problematic. So the research question today is, can improvements be made in targeting of money to high return investments? Is all hope lost for a win-win opportunity or do some still exist if we just do a better job of targeting our funding? So here is a graphic from previous work by our research team. And what we did is we estimated the house specific benefits from weatherization, which is just doing all kinds of environmental efficiency upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades to a home. Um, and we added up the stream of benefits, which is from the avoided cost of generating and delivering that energy to your home, and also the uh, avoided pollution damages. So together we call those social costs. And we added up those social costs over the lifetime of these upgrades, and we ranked them from lowest performance to highest performing homes. And this black line represents our estimate of each home savings with this ranking and the gray lines are the 95% confidence interval. The red dashed line 
uh, below the zero axis there uh, indicates the average benefits in our sample. And we actually find negative average benefits from this uh, weatherization assistance pro program, which is the largest uh, efficiency program in the United States. And uh, indicating the average benefits yeah, are negative. But if we look at the right-hand side here, Anything to the right of this point where the black line crosses the zero axis, that's where the marginal benefits exactly equal the marginal costs. These are homes for which the costs very much outweigh the benefits. And in particular, if we were to look at just the top 25% of homes, we have a benefit cost ratio of 1.55. So if you could exclusively treat or target these top homes, then the benefit cost ratio would be really high. Uh, but this ranking that we put together had the benefit of hindsight, right? We knew we were able to observe what the savings were and calculate it uh, for each home. But what we want to know is, could we identify those homes that would be high savings before any of the retrofits are done? So is this something that policymakers could do? So uh, the first part of our research, it just asked whether machine learning uh, can accurately predict the savings from these homes using data available pre-retrofit only, or what we call ex ante. Can we try to identify the projects that have higher net benefits? And second, could there be gains in the cost effectiveness of these energy efficiency programs by using machine learning versus the status quo model to select or target uh, which projects that we do? So just a little background on the data and setting of our research. We work with around 10,000 homes served by the Illinois Weatherization Assistance Program, which provides free retrofits to low income families. Think of these as full house retrofits. They're going in, they're working on insulation, air sealing, um, sometimes upgrading your furnace, things like that. Uh, we look at program years from 2009 to 2016. We have rich data on, from the energy audits on the housing structure, um, very detailed measurements on how much insulation you have, the age of your heating and cooling equipment, all kinds of things about the house. We also have information on the demographics of who's living there, how many people, roughly what their ages are, uh, income and other characteristics. We know which upgrades have been performed and how much each thing costs. And then we've also have access to engineering projections of savings. So these are sort of the status quo uh, projections of what the savings will be. Those are based purely on equations of structural relationships of um, the house and its environment, and they don't have access to, for instance, billing data, which is one of the things we take advantage of. So we have monthly natural gas and electricity consumption data. We have weather data on min and max temperature and precipitation. We have energy prices. And importantly, uh, most residential programs rely on the same Department of Energy accepted underlying engineering equations to predict their savings. So what we find here for this particular program in Illinois is likely going to have um, external validity and be applicable to programs, any kind of residential retrofit program that uses these similar equations. So why uh, are we interested in using machine learning? Machine learning algorithms are designed for accurate predictions, right? These are used all the time in the private sector to try to predict what you want to buy next on Amazon, what you should be watching next on Netflix. Uh, and what we want to do is see if we can predict uh, which homes are on the far right tail there that are going to get a lot of savings. Um, we have this unique situation because the auditors collect data on such a wide range of home and household characteristics which is really ideal for machine learning. It allows us to consider many complex interactions uh, between all these different aspects that we observe. Okay, so the first question that we asked with our research is, can we predict accurately what the housing energy consumption of a home is? And in particular, can we do that well out of sample? So what we do is we split our sample of homes into a set of homes that we use to train the machine learning algorithm, but then we predict into a holdout sample or homes that weren't included in that, and we try to see how well uh, can we make those predictions. And that's supposed to mimic what we want the policymaker to be able to do, right? To look at, use a set of homes that have already been weatherized and try to predict which uh, homes in a new pool are going to be the ones that have the highest savings. 
So what we have on this graph here is uh, on the x-axis, we've got months before and after retrofit installation. So anything to the right of this gray bar here, these are months after retrofit. So there's 12 months there. And then the negative numbers represent months before re uh, weatherization. So negative one, one month before. Okay, so we've got a full year before, a full year after. The blue line uh, is a measure of the average observed usage where the blue, light blue uh, around that line represents our 95% confidence interval of those estimates. And then the orange line is our machine learning predictions of what uh, home energy consumption would be. And this is then averaged uh, across those homes. Now the y-axis might be a little bit confusing, energy use deviation. The reason we use deviations is because depending on when in the year that a home gets weatherized, energy consumption would be really different, right, in the winter versus the summer. So what we've done is we've just demeaned it or taken out the average for the season. So think of this as a deviation in energy consumption from the average consumption for that month in the year. To the right of this, uh, down here, we have the energy consumption post weatherization. So you do see some nice savings that are happening as a result of this program. That's why the, this blue line is so much lower than the blue line to the left. And again, uh, we have really nice overlap between the orange and the blue line. So both before and after, the fact that the orange bars, which are a 95% confidence interval on the prediction, uh, overlap with these light blue bands show that these are statistically indistinguishable. So this is really good news. We're doing a great job of predicting energy consumption. Then what is unique about having these machine learning models is we can also predict what we call this counterfactual. So this green line here is our prediction of what energy savings would be uh, had weatherization not occurred. Now that's not, it does not, doesn't exactly overlap uh, with the zero line here. And the reason for that is that we have to use predicted weather, right? We're trying to exactly mimic the result, uh, the exercise that the policymaker is gonna do. Okay, so then the treatment effect is going to be the difference between what we predict energy consumption would have been and what we pre uh, had weatherization not happened and what we predict it would be had weatherization happened. So that's our treatment effect. And then our question is, using these predicted treatment effects, can we outperform the status quo in terms of being able to predict upfront which homes are going to have the most savings? So the y-axis on this graph is gonna be the cumulative net benefits from the homes in our sample. And here we've ranked our homes from the highest performing to the lowest performing. So the blue line uh, represents the actual observed savings from each home. And so we call this ex post because we, this is from an evaluation where we actually observed what the savings were for these houses. So the way to read this graph is since we've ranked these from highest to lowest, as you continue to add homes, the benefits are increasing because these are the net present value positive homes that have positive net benefits, but at a decreasing rate. And at some point you get into the ranking of homes where there are no longer uh, positive returns to treating these homes. And that's why the cumulative net benefits start decreasing and they even end up going below the zero axis. So this is how we get that homes have negative savings on average. Um, all right, now the orange line represents um, the cumulative net benefits. If we were to rank the homes from lowest to highest based on our machine learning model, and we're gonna call it ex ante because we don't have the benefit of hindsight. So we're just trying to guess what the savings would be, okay? And, we're, and if we rank the net benefits, uh, add up the net benefits of a home based on the machine learning prediction, we don't exactly match the blue line because you know, we're just doing a prediction, but we're doing pretty well, right? If we, tar if we targeted based on uh, our machine learning estimates, we'd get some nice positive benefits here. The green line is if we were to rank homes based on the ex ante engineering estimates or the status quo estimates, okay? And that's uh, the line you see here. And then the red line is just uh, a point of reference, which is if you were to rank the homes at all, you would just sort of randomly uh, treat these homes in no particular order. 
And what the big takeaways from this are is, sorry, uh, the green line does much better than random. Okay, so what we have right now, there's clearly some signal in the noise. They're doing a decent job of predicting uh, savings, but the orange line does even better. So our machine learning predictions uh, are doing even better. And what we can read from these black lines are, if you were to, for instance, target the top 20% of homes uh, based on machine learning estimates, you would get $900,000 more in benefits than if you were to do it based on the engineering and so on, right? If we were to target the top 40% of homes, we could get over a million dollars more benefits, uh, cumulative benefits from this program using our machine learning estimates than what we could do with the engineering estimates. So uh, to conclude, our study shows that these machine learning based predictions can outperform comparable predictions from engineering models and that targeted investments based on this method could substantially increase cost effectiveness of retrofit programs. Maybe some of these win-win opportunities are back. So here's a cost uh, back of the envelope calculation. The International Energy Agency uh, promulgated an increase in worldwide energy efficiency investments from 140 billion to 220 billion per year by 2025. If we extrapolate our 21% increase in the benefits that we could get by targeting through machine learning, it would yield a $50 billion per year improvement. And this approach could be applied to a wide range of programs that currently rely on uh, similar engineering models. Similarly, we focus on the cost effectiveness at the home level, but the approach could be extended to target measures even within a given home and yield even more savings than uh, we've shown here today. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Does anybody have questions? You can put them in the chat box and we have a minute or two for questions. I guess I have a question, a host prerogative. Um, how easy is it for, you know, the, the people who are running these programs to use these machine, machine learning tools? Good question. Um, I think, I mean, once the model has been run, it, it would be pretty easy to uh, create a situation where you could plug in new households and get that prediction. Um, so you probably would need to hire some professionals to do the initial uh, prediction. But then once you have that up and running, you, you should be able to use it for several program years, I would guess, pretty accurately. And in fact, we are working with the Illinois Weatherization Assistance Program to try to implement something like this. That's great. So the state of Illinois can save money because of this work. Anybody else? Oh, hi, Erica. Great talk. So, um, you know, one of the, so I guess from your analysis, to what extent are you able to uh, explain, you know, where one might observe an energy efficiency being effective and where it isn't? I mean, one of the things about machine learning models is that uh, it becomes really hard to discern those factors and they become a little bit like black boxes, but is there a way to be able to figure out what, what explains, uh, you know, where these investments may be targeted? Yeah, I mean, we, we could certainly do that. We haven't yet, but, you know, just sort of look at a table of the characteristics of homes that are predicted to be on the highest level versus the lowest. Um, and in our previous research, when we've looked at the wedge between projected and realized savings and tried to explain that, uh, there's particular measures like um, insulate, wall insulation, where we have real, a really high wedge between projected and realized savings, and that tends to be correlated with homes that are less cost effective. So we've done a little bit of that, um, but we could certainly dig into it more to try to say like which specific uh, types of homes seem to be yielding the highest benefits. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, you're on mute, Amy. Thank you. Uh, if you have a link to a paper that you can put in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, maybe we can share something with people later. Um, but now we're gonna turn it over after that great first talk. Next up, we have Nick Paulson. Um,
talking about win-wins and field level practices and take it away, Nick. All right, thanks, thanks, Amy and um, Erica. Already, already used the phrase win-wins a few times, um, and so I'm going to be uh, presenting some work here. Um, I want to be very upfront that I'm basically a, a free rider at this point on a lot of this work. I, uh, I'm presenting it today. Um, and I've been, I've been involved, but the real credit um, should go to to Gary Schnicki uh, in ACE, and then Sarah Sellers, one of our our PhD students who I. Uh, believe is 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 on the, uh, the the meeting here this morning, and I'm gonna toss any any hard questions Sarah's way, and then also Laura Gentry, um, who's with uh, both Illinois Corn and um, Natural Resource and Environmental Sciences here in the in the College of Aces. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some some work we have going on in partnership with the, the corn growers and their uh, PCM or Precision Conservation Management Program. Um, and so to, to start off, uh, just a little bit about what PCM is or what is PCM. Um, so this project began in 2015 with um, initially with a um, three and a half million dollar NRCS uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant. And the objective is to work one on one with farmers uh, to help them understand some of the costs and some of the benefits of adopting uh, new, new conservation practices. Um, so what the project does is it, it collects data from all the par participating farmers, and then it uses aggregated and anonymized versions of that farmer uh, field level farmer database um, to, to just help provide information to the participants, as well as um, get the word out you know, to, the, to the broader public about um, the conservation practices that we, we know have some level of environmental benefits, uh, but more importantly, what some of the economic implications are and scenarios in which, you know, we might get those win-wins where we have both the environmental benefits and uh, improvements to, to, to the bottom line for the, for the farmer. Um, so this project was a response, uh, direct response to the Illinois uh, Nutrient Loss Reduction. Um, and uh, that was uh, came from Illinois EPA and uh, and DOA um, in in response to the directive from from the US EPA. And so you know everybody in this group is probably familiar with that. But they have the, the longer term goal by 2035 of reducing um, uh, total N and P losses by 45 percent um, in the entire Upper Mississippi River Basin. So. Um, that's, that's a little bit about what, what PCM is. Um, a little bit more information about the program, um, some statistics about the uh, size and scale. Um, so again, this, this data set is, um, is really, what's, um, really what sets uh, PCM apart. And the way that this is put together, we're, we're, uh, the project is focused um, mostly in I guess kind of central Illinois here, you can see there on the map on the left, some of the counties where some of the participating farms are located. Um, there's also some participating counties now in Kentucky. Um, as of 2020, uh, the data set itself has data, uh, field level data on more than 10,000 uh, fields uh, within those participating regions and covers uh, over 800,000 acres in terms of those, those annual observations about different um, conservation practices and the economics that are associated with those things. The program is growing. Um, so in, in, you can see the, the growth in, in some of those charts there in the center, um, consistent growth in terms of the number of fields, the number of acres in the program, uh, continued growth uh, in 2021, where we'll see expansion to some uh, counties in southwestern Illinois, northwestern Illinois, um, and uh, in uh, North Central Illinois as well. So um, the, the, the folks that are tied to some of those regions there in Illinois, those are some of the PCM specialists that work with the farmers in the program. Um, so they help them um, with uh, collecting the data, providing the data, entering it into the uh, user-friendly uh, web portal uh, that the program uses, um, and then helps them kind of interpret and understand uh, some of the information that comes out of that data. So uh, looking at some of the benchmarking and the comparisons uh, that farmers can see so they can you know, assess whether 
some of these conservation practices that some of their peers are adopting, um, if and how they can uh, implement them on, on their operations as well. Um, there's a, a number of corporate, government, NGO, nonprofit partners that are, are part of the, the PCM um, overall projects. So you can see a lot of their uh, logos listed here. Um, there was a, an additional RCPP uh, award given to the, to the project in 2016, um, as well as, as funding from some of these partners that have helped kept the program going. Um, and and this, this partnership, uh, this, this big group of partners is also another uh, kind of a big showcase for the success so far of the, of the project in terms of how it's rolled out um, over just the, the first five years of its, of its, of its existence. Um, a little bit on the on the data collection side of things. So there's uh, four layers in the uh, the way PCM collects its database. So um, everything is at a field level, um, and then split out by the different crops that the PCM farmers produce. And then there's different uh, systems where data is collected to to look at averages and ben and benchmarks within those systems, and then also um, programs that are looking at you know literally every single pass that grows across the field in terms of timing, uh, what that pass was doing, whether it's tillage, harvest, uh, nutrient or, or other chemical application, uh, what inputs are being used, the rate at which those things are going on, uh, timing, which I think I already mentioned. Um, so just a lot of uh, field level detail about everything that's going on um, throughout, the, throughout, the growing, uh, throughout the growing season. Um, so then it's, it's this data then that's, that's used to uh, generate um, economic reports that go back to each one of the individual farmers, um, as well as uh, some of the, the research that Professor Schnitke and, and Sarah and myself are, are involved with in trying to put together um, aggregated benchmarks to try to, uh, again, provide information and showcase uh, some of these conservation practices that are, um, are working uh, from an economic standpoint, even in the, in the relative short term that we've been able to, to collect the data on it. Um, so the, the PCM practice standards um, that I'm gonna focus on sharing is a few results from uh, still this morning and in the time I have um, are uh, focused on different tillage practices that farmers do, uh, the implementation of, of various types of cover crop strategies, and then uh, nutrient management. So looking at um, mainly uh, this morning, at least looking at different uh, timing and application um, procedures uh, for, for nitrogen, and then also looking at the amount that, that, that farmers are putting on and whether there can be adjustments there um, that can both um, improve envi uh, environmental outcomes as well as some of the, uh, as, as well as the economic returns that, that farmers um, achieve. All right, so um, first up is, is just a little bit of the results that we've seen so far on tillage. Um, so in this slide, you just kind of get a sense for uh, the different types of tillage practices that farmers uh, in the PCM data set are doing. So there's uh, good coverage of kind of all the, from, from one extreme, uh, no-till practices all the way to uh, what would be probably cons uh, considered more historical, traditional three plus tillage passes. Um, you know, most of the uh, data is, is concentrated somewhere in the middle, um, although uh, no-till on, on soybeans is, is nearly half of the acreage that, that has been in the program so far, um, but still quite a few people uh, within uh, the PCM regions that are doing uh, two or more tillage passes. Um, and based on the results that we've seen, um, definitely evidence that, you know, there's on the, on those good chunk of acres that are, are still doing two or more passes of tillage. Uh, we can see some improvements in returns along with some reductions in tillage passes by moving to those no-till one pass or strip till systems. Uh, next slide is um, one of the first, uh, first couple of slides on, on, on the cover crop area. Um, so the thing I wanted to highlight here on this slide mainly is just the, um, the number of fields, the number of uh, data points in the, in the overall data set where we're seeing farmers implementing some sort of cover cropping pra uh, practice, whether it's a, a fully overwintering cover crop that needs to be addressed in the spring or whether it's a winter terminal. 
um, and seeing evidence on, on those practices where um, farms can not only achieve potentially lower um, costs, but uh, more importantly, higher uh, net returns by implementing some of those cover, cover crop procedures. So um, I think if you do the math there, um, you know, that's, that's over uh, 10% when you combine corn and soybeans um, of the field level observations that we're seeing using some sort of, of cover crop practice. So um, it's giving us really good uh, comparisons, really good evidence of some of the benefits that can be achieved, even in the uh, really, relatively short time frame that we've got here um, in the data since 2016. Um, another uh, point to make on the, on the cover crop side of things is a private partnership uh, between PepsiCo and uh, the PCM farmers. So uh, Pepsi providing some, um, some, some corporate dollars to try to, uh, to, to do some cost sharing on, on cover crop practice adoption. Um, and you can see there uh, some of the metrics associated with, with that partnership that have already, uh, have already been realized in terms of uh, emissions reductions um, from, from that cost sharing. Um, and again, this is just you know, recognition that we're seeing um, some of the corporate partners for the project really seeing value in, in working with farmers and, and really helping agriculture lead the way in, in terms of uh, some of these conservation strategies to to do things like like emissions reduction. Um, moving on to uh, nitrogen uh, as I wrap up here. Um, first on uh, timing, so uh, really good uh, coverage in the data in terms of the different timing approaches to nitrogen. Everything from all fall application to everything being uh, applied mostly per post-emergence with, with side dressing uh, to combinations and everything in between. Um, and, and one of the, I think the, the broad results that we've seen in, in analyzing the data here is that fall applications, um, which are often associated with some of the biggest potential um, negative environmental outcomes, um, often results in the highest total and applied, but often the lowest um, returns. Um, so seeing some really good evidence that there can be some, some economic improvements uh, in addition to the environmental improvements that we see from, from moving away from uh, fall application of, of, of nitrogen via, via anhydrous. Um, looking at the amount of nitrogen applied, um, again, this is a lot of this credit needs to go to Professor Schnicki and, and Sarah and Laura in uh, comparing what farmers are doing relative to the um, maximum return to nitrogen or MRTN rates that are recommended um, for, uh, for uh, corn and soybean production in the Midwest. Um, and you know, just you know, these, these MRTN rates um, are, are the nitrogen rates based on relative prices that would be predicted to generate the highest returns, not necessarily the highest yield, um, which is historically a lot of times where farmers have maybe gotten their information or made their nitrogen application rate choices. Um, but this is, this is really a shift to focusing on the economics of it rather than just trying to maximize yield. Um, and so in, in the, just a couple of scatter plots here, um, you know, one thing the data is showing us is that it's, it's one confirming that um, a, a good number of farmers are applying rates that exceed um, those MRTN rates, you see, um, you know, well over half, and it's, it's actually about two thirds of the observations in that scatter plot are these are these are actual observations from the data. So these are rates applied to specific fields over that 2015 to 2019 timeframe. You can see most of those are greater than what we would say is the the recommended rate to maximize returns. Um, and you can see that, you know, if I, if I fit a trend line to that, there would be a positive trend. Um, and so yields do increase uh, across the range over some of the nitrogen rates that we're looking at, but um, they don't exceed in a way that increases returns. So the additional yield we're getting over this, this range is not offsetting the additional costs that go into that. Plus we have some of the um, environmental uh, outcomes associated with those, with those higher rates. Um, and I think I'll skip ahead here to the end because that's all just talking about what was in the chart there. 
And so just to summarize, again, the PCM is really focused on tillage, cover crop experimentation, and nitrogen timing and application rates. Within each one of these categories, um, we are identifying evidence just, just over the last uh, four or five years of data that we have that farmers can not only implement these conservation practices that lead to environmental benefits, but there really are win-win situations where we're looking at lower costs and higher overall net returns. And then uh, just my final slide here before we open it up for questions, um, you know, the, the PCM project you know, in partnership with those of us in ACE and, and those of us on the farm doc team, um, you know, trying to get the, the word out and publicize this work via um, extension publications on, on farm doc daily, as well as uh, research reports that, that PCM is releasing uh, directly on their website. So more details, more information can be found there. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy and we can see if there's some questions. Great, thank you. So great talk. Um, we do have one question already, uh, two questions. Um, first, do you have some idea how these conservation adopt adoption rate changes with ag institutions like tenancy structure? So is it that cash rent is bad for conservation compared to crop share? Is that what's going on in Illinois? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, think the, I think the thinking, um, the hypothesis is that there, there would be a relationship between tenancy um, and particularly in shorter term um, cash rent situations, we might expect to see uh, less incentives uh, to be in place to adopt some of these conservation practices. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you want to chime in on this. Um, I think that's something that's on the agenda to look at with the PCM data, because uh, we are going to link that up with, with FBFM data and the cases where that's, where that's feasible. Um, and, and we'll be able to see what the farms that are adopting these practices, what position they're in in terms of land, land tenure. But I don't know if Sarah has anything else to add on that or not. Um, I don't think so, but thank you. Okay. Um, so there are two other comments in the chat. Since we only have two minutes, I'm going to ask a shorter question from Madhu. And Nick, maybe um, after we switch over, you can address Dave Bullock's comment in the chat directly. So Madhu asked, why was the MRTN rate constant over time and space in your analysis? Uh, it was not. Um, so the, the MRTN, it was one of the slides I skipped over because of time. I yeah. wasn't as well uh, got it. As, uh, as, uh, as Erica was. So there, the MRTN is very, um, at least year specific uh, in terms of the relative prices of corn um, and, and nitrogen fertilizer. And so the, that MRTN does, does vary across time and it does vary across space to some extent, although I don't wanna upset David because I know he doesn't think it varies enough across space, so. Okay, great. So we thank you very much. We're going to move on to our third and last speaker, Bruce Sherrick. But Dick, you can answer other questions in the chat box while Bruce is talking. Sure. So last but not least, we have Professor Bruce Sherrick, a professor at the University of Illinois, and he's going to talk to us about crop, crop insurance and conservation. Thanks, Amy. Turn that on. We'll be good to go. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the chance to walk through some stuff here. I'm at about 80% voice today, so if I give out, I apologize in advance. I was thinking about putting that famous um, far side comic up first that says, bummer of a birthmark how, where there's a deer standing up with a birthmark in the shape of a kind of a target on their chest because crop insurance quite often is, is kind of uh, used as one of the things that we say, is this in favor of or opposed, opposed to conservation investments and so on. So I just wanted to kind of walk through some of the things we're doing and point out one of the larger projects that we're beginning um, to do. And again, let me get my screen all the way in control here. So first, it's probably important to do a little bit of an empirical kind of level setting activity. This first slide is just to say how big is crop insurance actually and where does it exist in the farm bill? And in particular, crop insurance and conservation are roughly the same size now, <clears throat> the projected outlays favor crop insurance by a little bit. Uh, conservation title is actually expanding through time a little bit. Crop insurance is very stable, but within the farm bill, the nutrition or SNAP programs clearly dominate. There are good political reasons for this, of course. You would want to have a very strong um, support, I guess, from 
a broad coalition of other folks. And so we have for the last uh, seven or eight farm bills, uh, not even contemplated uh, pulling apart the nutrition portion of the farm bill. Uh, crop insurance per year though, let me go on to the next slide a little bit here. Um, this is a long time uh, kind of converting from projected to actual. Uh, this was done by one of our former PhD students, Jim Monkey, and some others at uh, CRS. And uh, to look at the size of the blue, which is crop insurance, and look at the size, which is green, of conservation, one of the things that's apparent is that the crop insurance title expenditures end up being very countercyclical. They, they expand in, in years where you need a lot. They shrink in years where you don't need a lot. And the conservation title is a much more constant uh, set of outlays. The commodity program, the red, which are things like ARC and PLC and traditional commodity programs, support payments and other uh, transition payments. Again, those are also kind of politically pulled around and become larger when there's a bigger demand for such payments and smaller when there isn't. But um, focus on 2012 in particular, where crop insurance was a very large expenditure and then the following year in 2013 where it was also a very large expenditure and then it'll begin to make sense. Uh, the counter cyclicality is really important because crop insurance pays more when there's a greater need and one of the major defenses for crop insurance is that it helps avoid the need for ad hoc disaster assistance. So in 2012, for example, one of the largest droughts, one of the most widespread large droughts in the eastern part of the Corn Belt, there were no ad hoc disaster payments because crop insurance worked pretty well. Well, crop insurance was a big expenditure that year. And one of the features of crop insurance that's really critical to understand is that it's, uh, pricing is reset every year. And what happened in 2012 uh, bled over to 2013. So we ended up with two years of very high, pay high payments and high prices based on a one-year drought. Linking these, though, has been this increasing um, use of agriculture as part of the solution rather than, than simply part of a problem when we're looking at carbon and climate related activities and the number of efforts to try to link crop insurance to the impact on farm of production practices and get things indemnified correctly within the crop insurance program to help um, align the incentives, I guess, of both producers and policymakers uh, has really accelerated in the last couple of years. Uh, we've been working for three four years now trying to get um, some hooks into the policy making uh, process, both on the crop insurance side and on the conservation side. And some pretty good outcomes have happened as a result. But I'll go really quick, quickly through some of the unique features of crop insurance because it's, it's kind of important to understand and it's not always completely well understood. There are about 200 different crops insured under federal crop, but the top three corn, soybeans and wheat are the vast, vast majority. So there are horseradish contracts and process pumpkin contracts and um, almost anything you can think of growing. There are contracts for tree uh, protection and um, citrus and so on. But in terms of the fraction of outlays of the, ten, just put it in perspective, the annual premium is around 10 billion. The annual liability is around 110 to 120 billion, depending on the starting prices, which we'll get to in a second but it's really a corn, soybean, wheat program plus everything else. Now the products are developed in a sense privately, but then implemented in a complete fashion with government mandated pricing. So the price you pay for insurance in a particular county is 100% predetermined. The company selling it to you can't change that number. They can only sell private product add-ons. And then there's a standard reinsurance agreement that most company, all companies have to use in order to uh, uh, offload some of the risk. The little table on the right is something that people often point to, but I, I included it because there's a bit of a misnomer here. The subsidy rate by coverage level for crop insurance is often shown in this table, and, and this is accurate. The government would pay, for example, 53% of an 85% coverage product on enterprise unit basis. And so people will say, well, it's a 53% subsidy. Well, it's the subsidy rate on full premium. The government actually uh, pays a few more expenses, but you don't know what that turns out to be until you find out what the loss rates are. So if, if the price that they charged happened to be roughly two times as high as it should be for actuarial fairness, 
and 50% was subsidized, you would just break even by buying insurance through time. On the other hand, if insurance was underpriced and you had a 50% subsidy, then you would make more than 50 cents per dollar of premium through time. So getting that really balanced is really critical and that's where the big leverage is in crop insurance because you can massively move production and massively move incentives based on this. To make this more complicated, there are um, huge numbers of insurance products and they're divided up by whether it's a farm level or an area plan of insurance, whether you insure revenue or yield and whether or not you can benefit from a harvest price increase or not. And then there are a whole bunch of supplemental add-ons, including SCO and PLC and ECO this year. That turns out that every farmer has well over a hundred choices to make just on their crop insurance policy alone each year. So another thing that's interesting is that indemnity prices reset in a very, very strange way that makes it very complicated to predict ahead of time what the take rate will be and what the, the sign up would be. So this little table below just shows for the last 11 years what the projected price would be. And that is, it works in the following way, focusing on corn and this year 459. 459 turns out to be the average of the December futures contract price during the month of February. Today is the very first day, March 1st through March 15th are the only days you can buy crop insurance in a year. So we're about to place $10 billion of, of premium in just two weeks. <clears throat> and then if the price goes up, and in each of those years, it's, it's bolded if the end of year price was higher than the beginning of year price. If the harvest price is higher, the government just ups the amount of insurance you got. So instead of multiplying by looking at 2020, 388, you get insurance that's denominated as though the price was 399 instead. So there's a very complex optionality involved. And then the ratio between the corn and soybean prices, of course, determines an awful lot about what you would choose to do. Just a quick plug, we have some um, massive uh, crop insurance simulation tools on the web for free. Um, these are all hosted by NCSA now because they're numerically fairly complex. But the, uh, the middle two, I'll just point out, the crop insurance payment evaluator, we run roughly 600 counties, all possible combinations of coverage and product for case farms, and then evaluate the probability of getting a payment, the net cost of insurance, and then risk reduction effects, how good of a job it does of cutting off your left-hand tail. Uh, the other tools likewise get used a lot just to figure out what your behavior should be at the beginning. So again, we're um, super fast here. Um, about 88% of Illinois corn is insured, 87 soybeans, 72 wheat. And this is really important because the answer is all commercially important production is actually insured. So this has, as a program, has the capacity to be a very large um, kind of needle moving uh, program if there are uh, procedures or you know, attributes built into the program that would favor different behaviors. Conservation, flip to that and then I'll kind of glue them together at the end. Virtually all of the major conservation, major um, commodity groups have come together to establish some sustainability goals. Corn, soybeans, wheat, um, each of the major commodity groups has some form of this. And they tend to focus on something like the field to market framework. This is one of many, by the way, the commercial companies that are uh, trying to uh, convert uh, payments to farmers based on their um, tillage practices and cover crop usage have a different set of these. But just to point out, most have figured out that land use and, and erosion and irrigated water use and energy use and greenhouse gas emissions are areas that you could focus on and say, did we improve or not based on uh, through time activities. And I just wanna point out that these, these are not uncontroversial because the counterfactuals matter a lot. Um, the, uh, both of the previous uh, presentations today were really fun to listen to. I think about this uh, nitrogen argument as well, and a lot of what was done in PCM, and Dave's question about the correct amount to apply. <clears throat> it's not actually the amount you apply, it's the amount that escapes, and I'll show you this in a minute why that's a really big thing to get right. Um, if you put a lot of nitrogen on and the result is you grow a lot of corn and none of it escapes and you have a lot of green matter and put a lot more roots in the ground, more nitrogen actually captures carbon. Of course, you can't predict that ahead of time, so we don't make those kind of calculations because they're not predictable. 
And we want to figure out if we should measure these in a per unit or a per output basis, because that also changes things a lot. Um, the next point is that we don't have much synchronization between the efforts to develop these markets. You know, Nori and Sibo and Indigo and about 20 other companies now are providing channels for payments to farmer based on practices that are presumed to have some impact on carbon because the Black Rocks and the Pepsis and the Walmarts have kind of said, we promise to be fill in the blank carbon neutral or carbon uh, restorative or something by a certain year. And they're discovering that agriculture is absolutely a critical linkage to get that done. Um, I'll put a little bit of um, more formality in a slide or two, but the point is that if you want to influence any of these activities with crop insurance, it has to also be consistent with the other incentives the farmer has. So we'll talk about those kind of with some references to historical points. Uh, corn, of course, the largest crop in the U.S., and it really increased the area with the second gray bar is kind of the RFS period. We kind of went to a, a somewhat permanent plateau at around 90 million acres. We've taken a lot of the acres away from wheat, and kind of two-thirds of the world and three-fourths in the U.S. have these two as the major crops. Now, here's just an example, not trying to... Um, be either controversial or not, but just a way of thinking about why it's so complicated to tie this into a crop insurance activity. Uh, generally, if you increase the application of nitrogen and nothing else changed, you would end up with more greenhouse gas emissions, one, because it's very expensive energy-wise to make nitrogen fertilizer, and secondly, because it's still relatively cheap relative as an input to the farmer. Applying more as a form of insurance is not a bad management uh, design. But look at what's happened just through time in terms of measuring the application in pounds per acre versus pounds per bushel. And in particular, look at the impact of 2012 when we had a drought and not much corn was grown as a result. With the same application, you lost a lot on nitrogen because you didn't grow much. But if you had had a great year of production, you might have made more by over applying. So it's not a, it's just not, the point is it's simply not a simple question. Likewise, the relationship to erosion and soil organic matter is really complex because on one hand, you want, a lot of, you want to grow a lot of plant matter. You wanna do so without having to put on much um, you know, manufactured fertility products, uh, but you can't keep the uh, growth patterns as high if you don't. Uh, tillage and cover crop practices likewise, the PCM and several other uh, really nice projects are beginning to reveal to us what's happening there and they're beginning to creep into the good farming practice standards. So we now know more about how you can terminate cover crops ahead of insurance and make um, uh, kind of positive contributions to both your insurance program and your conservation efforts. So moving forward and then to the big project, and again, my understanding is these are, these are fun 15 minute teasers um, for um, big projects that we may all be in, involved in. But there was something called the, universe, uh, called the Ag Data Act in the last Farm Bill. And uh, we at the U of I were selected to conduct the pilot project. And this is really fairly profound because of the following features. One, we're getting for the first time ever, RMA level, field level data. And one of the vexing problems for estimating the impact of these activities through time has been that it's been difficult to get the data. Well, so we'll be the only place that has that. And included with that, we have cause of loss data. So it's highly disaggregated down to the specific claim to know whether it was a prevented law, prevented plant claim or a reduction in yield claim or a reduction in price claim or a wind or a hail or something like that. In addition, we have NRCS field level supplemented with lots of other attributes because of the ability to do so now. We've gotten a lot better at using satellite data and LIDAR and so on to know what slope and elevation and other attributes of the land were so that we can do the study that's, that's working in the following way. 2019 was a remarkably wet year and the water occurred at the upper section of the Corn Belt across several states. Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa have really different adoption rates on cover crops. So in the sense where you want to use the term, this is the best ever natural experiment to create an identification scheme where we can look at the impact of different historic tillage, cover crop practices, and state level policies, have soil underneath it, and have actual claim data clear down to the subfield level 
to determine what the, the actual empirical impact was of histories of cover crop usage um, with weather and across three very distinct regions, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa. We have six states total, but that's the area that the, the water was greatest uh, into South Dakota. Likewise, there was a lot of preventive plant to determine what the impact was of these practices on crop insurance. And this feeds directly back into crop insurance design. So again, not to go too far on this, but there are a couple of approved crop insurance development projects too that take this kind of information and feed it back into the ratings so that in the future you would expect things like split nitrogen insurance policies and uh, policies that are rated differently if you have cover crops or policies where the amount of um, residue left on the surface would be uh, part of the rating. And my timer says I'm out of time, so I'll quit and move on to uh, the questions if there are any. Skip forward directly to that. Great, thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, any comments or questions? At the speed of an auctioneer, it didn't allow the, the uh, formation of coherent questions, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I can, it's all This good. is Ben, I can ask a quick question, Bruce. Please do. So are, do you have any preliminary findings about the, um, any differences in, in uh, sort of yield deviations with those in those uh, cover crop areas under that extreme moisture year of 2019? Uh, not, not from the current project, but from related, more aggregated, and then some, so, so as you know, and you've done a lot of work in this area, just stitching together the data layers is really complex. And to do that in an initial way with related data so that we're kind of like testing our models on the way in, you, you find out that it's a little more complicated than we might have anticipated and that the severity of the weather event is really important to get right. So think of it this way. If you had an area that had all used identical amounts and histories of cover crop and had, you know, uniform distributions of soils, they vary, but, you know, the same kind of profile in each area, then the most rainfall, it kind of looks like a bullseye in one spot where there's so much rain that the cover crops might interfere with dry out or termination can have one effect. The next ring out, percolation is better. So you get the next ring out, it savaged a little bit more a little different. So there are these sort of waves of effects that seem apparent, uh, but until we go all the way down to within field, the most difficult thing to control for is the fact that farmers are really smart and they tend to use the practice that makes the most sense in their location. And the conversion of tillage is a really hard thing to reverse. So there tends to be a, um, you know, the conversion lever is not a single period calculation. So when you go to no-till, for example, or start introducing these activities, it's you can't back away from them and you can't make those uh, switches costlessly at one point in time. So. A little more than you, you ask, but yeah, it's we do not from the specific of the field level yet in trying to design the model. We're, we're figuring out a lot of things we didn't realize ahead of time. That's great, thank you. Thank you for that interesting talk and I think we'll all be excited to see how that big research 